The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, and He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm Marion Pina, and I've been walking, truly, truly walking with Jesus. Oh my goodness, what about 40 years now? Well, and my walk with is to, to know that He's there for me. And I can at any time communicate with Him. That doesn't mean I get the answer right away, but I have peace of mind. Things can go crazy, okay? But I don't follow it anymore. That doesn't mean I don't ever worry about anything. That's unnatural for individuals. But I put it in prayer and I trust God daily, daily, for me and for family and for all those that I pray for. When you listen to Marion Pena talk, you almost get the sense that she knows what it means to walk with Jesus, don't you? I mean, pre pretty obvious, isn't it? Do you know that that's Pastor Roy's mom? One of our pastors here at Shoreline Church? I, I love listening to Mary, and I love watching Mary and just live her life because she walks with Jesus. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection, that Jesus who came, God among us, died on the cross for our sins in our place, was buried in the tomb for three days, and he rose again. And we celebrated that. But today we're talking about, we're starting into a series, talking about what does it mean, you know, can, can, we, can we walk with Jesus? I want you to imagine, just for a moment, just imagine that you lived 2,000 years ago and you got to walk around and follow Jesus when he walked on this earth. There's this whole group of, of, of men and women who followed Jesus, who listened to him teach. That would have been amazing to actually you know, physically walk with Jesus around that part of the world and listening to him teach and watching him do his miracles. And then imagine this. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, they buried him. When he rose again, after he rose from the grave, before he ascended to heaven, was about 40 days. And during that time, Jesus walked with people. He showed up. He had meals with people. He kept kind of just showing up and popping up different places and, and teaching and caring and exhorting and walking with people, and eating with people, and just, just doing it. What would that have been like? To the res I mean, now, it, now it's just, and when Jesus was risen, he was the same in ways, but he was radically different, right? What would that have been like to, to actually walk along with the risen Lord Jesus Christ? And I want to suggest to you that it's possible. That's actually God's design. When Christ rose again from the dead, when he ascended to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Spirit to be with you. I will be with you. And in a sense, Jesus said, you can spend all your, the days of your life actually walking through your normal daily life, walking with Jesus. So the best way to learn about what it looks like to walk with the resurrected Jesus is to open this book, the Bible, which we believe is true from beginning to end, and, and read those stories from the time that he rose from the grave until he ascended to heaven. That's what we're going to do for the next six or seven weeks. We're going to just look at that and we're going to ask the question, can I learn from how Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, walked with people, because maybe there's lessons we can glean and say, that might help me get a picture of what it looks like to walk with Jesus day by day and to follow him. Uh, because Jesus was sort of showing up and surprising people, I, I started thinking about there's something exciting about a surprise, about a new discovery. Now, my little boys are now all in their 30s, but I remember when they were little, little boys, and we had a jack-in-the-box. Now, I don't know if people do jack-in-the-box. It might be too scary for children today, might be, you know, maybe we're not allowed to use Jack in the Box, but my boys loved it. And like the first time the, the, the Jack in the Box popped out, and the 50th time, they got just as like, whoa, and then laugh, and they think it was so exciting. So if you, how many of you remember Jack in the Box? If we, okay, so, so 
You'll, you'll recognize the tune that hasn't changed. Ready? Remember that? You know what's coming if you know the tune. Remember that? So I would do that with my, my boys. Would go, they go, oh, and then they go, and they laugh. They go, and then they give you that look like kids do to parents, like that look like, which is what? Do it again. You know, so you take the arms and you tuck them in. You tuck the little guy down there. So, okay, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Now, I can do this all the whole sermon. <laughs> what did Kevin preach about? He just did this jack in the box like 57 times. It was sort of like um, kind of artistic. I don't know. Sure what it, no. uh, but with my boys, I can do it 30 or 40 times. And they would just keep, every, every time, it was like, don't you know, it's, I know it's coming. They did, oh, there it was again, right? Well, that, there's something about a surprise. If, if, if you're at a surprise birthday party, even if you don't really want a surprise birthday party, there's something about that moment when all your friends are there like, oh, surprise. You go, oh, that's wonderful. I remember hearing about when, when Sherry's dad gave her mom her diamond engagement ring, which was years after they were married. They didn't have the resources to buy a diamond when they got married. But years later, he surprised her. She'll never forget that moment. Well, what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels that we'll be looking at over these coming six weeks is we find that Jesus just keeps popping up. He keeps surprising people. And, and I said before that when Jesus rose from the grave, he was the same, but he was different. So his character was the same. He was God with us. He was Emmanuel. But he also, when he walked on this earth before he rose from the dead, he never like, had people in a room where the door was locked and he just appeared in the room. But now he could I believe when Jesus came among us, he came in a physical body so that he could die on the cross for our sins in our place and take our suffering. But now he has a risen body. So he's the same, but he's different. And you notice that in some of the stories that you read about Jesus. And so what we're going to do today is we're, we're going to say, say, God, open. I'm going to invite you and pray that God will help us open your eyes and see the risen Jesus. He's alive and present. That's the prayer today is that we would recognize God, open our eyes that we can see that Jesus Christ is risen. He's present. And then that we can learn to walk with him. And, and so we're going to start with what I call the text we believe, this book. That we believe this is God's word. We believe it's true. So if you have a Bible with you, if you have a Bible app, if you're here or at home and you want to turn to Luke chapter 24, we'll have all the passages on the screens. We'll have them on your screens at home. But if you want to follow along in your Bible and take some notes, that's great too. But we're going to walk through Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. And where we're picking this story up is it's still Resurrection Sunday. So Jesus has, has gone through the trials. He's been condemned wrongly. He's been crucified. He's buried. Three days have gone by. He's risen from the dead. The women have come to the tomb and, and, and seen the angels and, and then encountered Jesus. And, and now people are, word's getting out, but some people still don't believe. And there's these two guys. One's named Cleophas. The other one, we don't know their name. And they're walking back. They're leaving Jerusalem on the Emmaus Road to go back home to their hometown. It's about a seven-mile walk. Now, that means if you were to leave the church right here, walk out to 68th Street, which is a busy street. Don't walk on the street there. But if you were to walk on that street, you'd walk towards Salinas, go over the, some of the hills. You'd pass Corrado de Tierra. You'd pass San Benancio. You'd keep on walking. You'd get to a, about Fort Ord uh, on the left, the Fort Ord Hills, where there's a hiking area there and the monument there. And on the right, it's the Toro Cafe. That's about seven miles. So these, these two guys are walking along. That's where we pick up the story. It's Easter Sunday. They've heard rumors that Christ might be alive, but they don't really know what's going on, and they're walking home. By the way, no phones, no texting, not that it wasn't allowed. It didn't exist. There's no way to, so people back in their hometown won't know anything unless somebody travels and tells them what's going on. So they're heading back home again. We pick it up in verse 13 of Luke 24. If you have your Bibles, just follow along. Otherwise, follow along on the screens. Now that same day, the same day as the resurrection, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up 
and walked along with them. You get the picture? They're walking along, long walk, long hike back. They're going back, and Jesus is there. He's walking with them. Now, I'll give you a little clue, a little heads up. Jesus, now in his resurrected form, could not be in a room that was locked and then be in the room, and he could also make himself not be distinguishable. And he actually, for some reason, Jesus chose to make himself so that they would not recognize him. Why? I don't know. I read a number of different scholars. I read a number of different commentaries, which are big, thick books from very smart academic people, and, and nobody even dared to kind of give a guess. My sense is this. Here's my sense. I think Jesus made it so that they would not recognize him because he wanted to have this conversation about what they were thinking about and what they believed before they saw him. Because once they saw him risen, it's like, boom, we know it. He wants to see where they're at. That's my sense. But they're, he's walking, they're walking along, and here Jesus is, and he's walking along with them. So just... I want to make some observations of things of what does it look like if we actually live our lives today walking with the resurrected Jesus like they walked with him then? What lessons can we learn from their experience that can inform how we live our lives? So here's a first thought or first lesson. Jesus meets people on their road where they are going in the flow of their life. These guys aren't in a temple. They're not in a church. They're not in a religious place. They're just walking down the road. That's where Jesus met them. Get the picture? You can meet God in church. I hope you do. But you can meet God anywhere. And so they're walking along, and here Jesus is walking along with them. For me, Jesus met me at 15, almost 16 years old. I was a, I was a self-centered surf punk living in Huntington Beach, California. I just lived for myself. I, didn't, I, I grew up in, in what I call a very loving, healthy, atheistic home. My parents loved each other. They loved us kids, but there was no faith. There was no Bible. I got to watch one by one by one all five of us kids become Christians. I got to see my dad become a Christian. But at that time, I was growing up in an environment where there was no faith. And God met me. I, I start, and, and as I started to get to know Jesus, I found out I could, meet, I could meet Jesus out street skating. I could meet Jesus. I love, when I'm at the ocean, I feel, I feel God's presence. There's something about that place. For Sherry, it's Lake Michigan. When she's near Lake Michigan, where she grew up, she can feel the presence of Jesus. Uh, for, for Sherry, when she, when she was a distance runner for years, when she would run, she said, when I run, I just meet and feel the presence of Jesus. You probably have places like that. But for me, for me, at almost 16 years old, there was a moment where this Jesus who I'd heard about from other people, I encountered him. And I've never been the same. Let me ask you a question. If you have yet met Jesus, if you met Jesus, where did you first meet him? When was that moment when it wasn't about your parents taking you to church or somebody talking about religion, but you, you had this sort of this like, he's real, he's risen, he loves me. Remember those moments. Those are, those are critical, important moments in our lives. But one lesson that we can learn when we, when we just, when we walk through the, and again, we're walking through the stories the next six weeks of people encountering Jesus and experiencing him as, in his resurrection so we can say, how can I walk with Jesus as the resurrected Lord in my life today? So Jesus meets people on their road, where they're going, in the flow of their life. And, and that's just, that's exciting. Because we don't have to go to some sacred place. We can meet Jesus anywhere. And then the passage continues on. But they were kept from recognizing him. That for some reason, Jesus did not allow them to recognize him. So they're walking along. So there's a guy walking with them. Oh, there's another person on the road walking. And they start talking with him. But they don't know it's Jesus. But you'll find out as, you're, as you go through the passage, something's happening inside of them something spiritual, something dynamic, but they just don't name it. They don't recognize, so they don't recognize Jesus. And here's the thought about walking with Jesus. All right? Sometimes people don't recognize that Jesus is with them. You, people can be walking right alongside of Jesus and not recognize it. And if you say, well, that's kind of strange. How can you be walking next to Jesus and not recognize it? Well, if you're a Christian, let me ask this question. Do you ever go an hour or a day or a week and not notice the presence of Jesus? I bet you do. And he never leaves you. He dwells in you by his Holy Spirit. We can just get busy. I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a professional religious person. I, I, I spend my days teaching about Jesus, studying things, uh, leading a church. And I can tell you, there's hours and days where I can go and I can be busy doing Jesus-y stuff. That's the technical term for what pastors do. I can be busy doing like Jesus-y stuff and not even notice that he's with me. So it's just, just a good reminder as you walk through your days, if you're a follower of Jesus, pay attention and notice because he's there with you. Even when you walk into a situation that you're thinking, okay, Jesus, if you are coming along with me, please don't wait in the car. Uh, you don't want to see this. This is probably not where you want to go. If, if, you, if you can't bring Jesus with you, by the way, probably not a good place to go, right? But, but 
in every moment, slow down and notice, and you will, you will see that Jesus is with you. So, so they don't notice it, but Jesus is there with them. And then the passage continues on in verse 17. So they're walking along. They don't recognize who it is. And he asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, again, this is my, my own personal theory. If, if, if Jesus would let himself be known, they wouldn't have asked that question. They couldn't have had the conversation. And he wants to have this conversation with them. What are you discussing as you walk along together? And they stood still, their faces downcast. Now, you don't have to be a body, uh, you know, kind of, kind of like a, a specialist to designate how, what, you know, somebody's walking along and they stop as they're walking and they look down, downcast. There, there's, something, there's something heavy on their hearts. There's a burden they're carrying. Well, Jesus knows what they're talking about, but he asked them, what are you talking as, as you're walking along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? This is Easter Sunday. Jesus was crucified three days earlier. Now there's rumors that he's risen from the dead. No one's talking about anything other than this. This is the talk of the town. This is the talk of everybody. And so they're talking about, they're talking about Jesus. But Jesus says, what are you talking about, Right? And they say, Don't, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? Here's the thought as you, as you walk with Jesus. Okay, Jesus is curious about what is on your mind. Whatever's on your mind, Jesus is curious about it. He wants to know. He wants to hear from you. Even if it's things he are, you know, you're not going to inform Jesus of things he's not aware of. But he wants to talk with you. It's, it's called prayer. To talk with Jesus, to share what's on your heart. I've heard people say, well, why do, I need to, why do I need to pray? God knows everything already. Well, why would, a, why would a child have a conversation with a grown-up who may know what the child's gonna say? Why would the grown-up care? Imagine a little kid coming up to you. Maybe it's a niece or nephew, a son or a daughter, a grandchild. They come to you and they're in math, they're, in math. they're learning math and they're finally starting to make sense. And they come and they say, oh, can, you know, can I tell you some math stuff? And you can respond this way. No, I know math better than you do. Go away. Wouldn't recommend that. You'd probably say, sure, tell me. i say, can I tell you about fives? I've been learning about fives. And you're like, yeah, tell me about fives. So, okay. They say, this is gonna blow your mind, okay? If you take five plus five, you get 10. But if you take five minus five, you get zero. And if you take five divided by five, you get One. And if you get five times five, you get 25. It's crazy. As a grown-up, what do you say to them at that moment? You go, oh, that's amazing. Tell me, do you know about fours? Why are you asking them? Because you don't understand how math works, right? No, you're, you're asking because that's what you do. You, you talk with people you love. You listen to people you love. And even though Jesus is wiser than any of us, he says, hey, what are you thinking about? What's on your heart? Talk to me about it. If you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, you understand what I'm talking about. And Jesus, who's all wise, comes to you and says, tell me what's on your mind because I care about you. So as you walk through your days, talk with Jesus. Tell him what you're learning. Tell him what you're afraid of. Tell him what you're excited about. Notice his presence and talk to him. That's just called prayer. And you can walk and talk with Jesus. Our, a whole staff team from Shoreline did, did a thing where they walked, did prayer walking, where they just walked around different areas around here and prayed for you and for the church and for our community. Just walking through our community here praying. That's something we can do that should be a part of our lives. Jesus is curious about what's on your mind. He cares. So, so now, Jesus says, what are you discussing? What are you talking about as you walk along? They're like, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? It's, it's amazing. And, and so I love this. In, in verse 19, they say, you know, we're talking about, oh, you're the only one here that doesn't know these things that have happened. And Jesus says in verse 19, what things? Is it that Jesus doesn't know that he died on the cross and rose again? He wants them to, to share with him. So he says, What's, what things? Now, here's my little personal insight. Okay, Jesus has a sense of humor. I believe, if, if you can't read this passage and not get a little chuckle, if you have a vision of Jesus as this stoic, unfeeling, un, you know, never laugh, always serious, always intense, 
I think there are times where Jesus was very intense, but there's, I think there's times where Jesus cracked up with everybody else because he was fully human. And I think when he, when he says to them, what things? There's got to be a little bit in his own mind, just kind of this little bit like, you know, tell me. And so, and so, and so he, he, he says, what things? And then the passage goes on, and they start to share with him. Verse 24, chapter 24, verse 19. They say about Jesus of Nazareth. Think about it. He's there, he's, this is Jesus, the risen Lord walking with him. They just don't recognize him, but this is Jesus. They say about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Now, as I read this, I want you to notice the tenses and their feelings and what they're saying. Because they're not certain of some things. They're trying to figure stuff out still. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he, w- he was, passes, he was, not is, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. They don't know he's risen yet. So they're talking in the past tense. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. See, it's, it's past tense. They don't know yet. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That was our hope. That was our dream, right? And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us when they went to the tomb early this morning. It's Easter morning. That was Easter afternoon. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. But you can tell they're still not sure. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. What can we learn about walking with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus? Well, how about this? That Jesus walks with his people as they sort things out. Jesus, he, they don't have it figured out. They're not sure. They're talking past tense, and Jesus is right there. They don't have it all sorted out, but here Jesus is just walking with them, wanting them to understand, but just taking time with them. Do you understand that as you walk through your days, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, as you're walking with Jesus, he will walk with you as you're sorting things out. What kind of things? How to be family in our crazy world. How to forgive someone who's wronged you. He'll help you as you sort that out. How to handle your finances in a new way because you're a follower of Jesus. He'll walk with you as you figure it out. How to, how to live for him, how to love him, how to be his person in a world that keeps saying, don't be that person. He's patient and he walks with you as you sort things out. Here they are trying to figure it out and here Jesus is just walking with them, patient and kind. And then, oh, and I wanna, I wanna say too, for anybody, if you're gathered here, if you're online and you say, you know, I'm one of those people that I, I haven't put my faith in Jesus yet, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'd love to, if Jesus would walk with me and help me sort it, I want to figure out the whole Jesus thing. If that's you, we have something we just started just this last week. It's like a 10 or 12 week uh, small group kind of gathering of people where you share a meal and you watch a short video about, about Jesus and then you have just totally open conversation talking about Jesus. And you can ask any questions. You can say, I don't believe in that. I just, and nobody's going to condemn you or you just open conversation. If you go, man, I'd love to meet with some people for, you know, for a couple, you know, two and a half months and just once a week Learn about Jesus and talk about it. That'd be really helpful for me. When, you're, when we're done today, go to the Connection Center and just say, hey, tell me about that. It's called Alpha, which is the first uh, letter in the Greek alphabet, but it's just called Alpha. And just say, tell me about the Alpha group or that A, that A you know, if you just say, remember the first letter, A, but say that Alpha group. And uh, we'll connect you with somebody. But, but Jesus just says, walk with me. I'll walk with you and you can sort it out. That's huge. And then the story continues on. Verse 25. And so he, Jesus, said to them, how foolish you are. And you're slow to believe in all the prophets have spoken. They knew the prophets. They knew what it said about him, but they had kind of missed it. In verse 26, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus, as he walks with them, begins to explain Moses. He says, you know, in in the book of Isaiah where it says that he will, he will be taken like a lamb to the slaughter. By his wounds will be healed. He begins to open the prophets and open the, 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 the law and all the, all the ancient writings, and he begins to explain how they all point to the Messiah. Now think about it. Get this picture. They're walking with Jesus. It is the risen Jesus. They just don't recognize it. And he's now teaching them about how the scriptures point to the Messiah, to himself. But they had gotten it wrong. They thought the Messiah would be this, this powerful, conquering, political, military leader who would crush Rome and put, you know, put their people in charge. 
And Jesus said, no, he, this, the Messiah came to suffer and to pay the price and to die. Why? Because he could ultimately conquer sin, death, and hell. And can, I get, can I guarantee you something? Jesus conquering sin, death, and hell would have been better than Jesus conquering Rome. Right? Because he conquered sin, death, and hell for all of us. And so here they walk along. And Jesus begins to explain to them. He explained to them what, this, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, concerning the Messiah. Here's another lesson to learn. As you live your life, if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus or if you become a follower of Jesus, you can walk every day. You're supposed to walk every day and notice and recognize that the risen Jesus is with you and guiding you every day and every moment. So here's another thing to learn about walking with the risen Jesus. Jesus is the truth and always seeks to reveal the truth as we walk with him. As they're walking with him, they've got some things confused. They don't have it right. So what does Jesus do? He starts to explain to, to them from the scriptures what the truth is. In God's mind, there's not your truth or my truth. There's his truth. We don't get to make, if, if everyone gets to make up their own truth, then there is no truth. Right? If I say 5 plus 5 is 10, you say, well, for me, for me 5 plus 5 is 15. And I have to say to you, well, no, that's your truth. That's fine. We can't even communicate. There's either truth or there isn't. And so, so, Jesus, so as Jesus walks with them, he's explaining what's true. Can I encourage you to keep walking? If you're a Christian, keep walking with Jesus. As you walk with him, can I challenge you, open this book and read it every day until your life ends, every day. Listen to it or read it. Either way, get it in your mind, get it in your heart. And if you say, well, I don't know where to start or where to read in the Bible, we actually create, every week that I preach or every week that one of our other pastors preach or any guest preacher, we lay out a seven-day reading plan to get you ready for the next Sunday sermon. And we put, it, we put it on our website and we put it on the Shoreline app. So if you have it on the Shoreline app, all you have to do is open your app, go to the reading, and you go, it's day two, so, it, so it's, uh, it's Monday, it's day one, you click, you hit number one, it opens the passage, you can read it off your phone or your tablet, or you can open your Bible if you find the passage, or you can actually hit a button that has a speaker, and you can let your phone or your app read the Bible to you. But every day, let the truth of God's word fill you, and as you walk with Jesus, say, Jesus, I want to walk in your truth, I want to walk in your ways, I don't want to just have my own opinion or somebody else's opinion. And so Jesus, as he walks with these people, he explains to them the truth. Now, I think now they're getting ready to recognize who it is they're talking to. And so we pick it up at verse 28 of Luke chapter 24. As they approach the village, now they've gone, they're seven miles, they're coming near Emmaus. As they approach the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. Very common practice in the ancient world. There were not hotels, there were not places to stay, but if somebody was traveling, it was going to be night, traveling at night was dangerous, no street lights, no flashlights. I mean, so they said, well, come stay. Very common. So he stays. They sit down to have a meal. I love this. They sit down to have a meal. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He did this so many times in the Gospels. He took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Jesus just sort of dropped the veil. And then they're at the table. They're like, it's Jesus. And watch what's next. And he disappeared from their sight. He never did this before he rose from the dead. This was not a Jesus thing before he rose. But now he's in a resurrection body. So he keeps them from seeing who he is. I think to have this great conversation, now they're ready to recognize him. He drops the veil. They see him and he's gone. Interesting story, isn't it? Interesting story. So, Insight for how you walk with Jesus. Just walking with the resurrected Jesus in your normal life. Jesus loves to unveil his presence in the ordinary moments and places of life. Jesus wants to show you that he's with you. Pay attention. Open your eyes. Tune in. He loves it. You're in the middle of a tense relational conflict, maybe even a fight or tension. Jesus says, pay attention. Look, I'm right here. And if you recognize his presence, you know what? All of a sudden that tension starts to change. Okay, Watch my mouth. You know, <laughs> wait, hang on. And everything looks different when you know Jesus is right there with you. Um, he wants to unveil his presence. When we gather in worship, yes, I, I hope you experience the presence of Jesus. But he can unveil his presence anywhere, all the time. He wants to show himself to you. So ask him and pay attention and slow down and notice. Unplug, disconnect all the distractions and say, Jesus, are you here with me right now? I will tell you something. If you're a Christian, and you ask this question, Jesus, are you here with me right now? I know what the answer is every time. Yes. 
Can I tell you, let you a really cool secret? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and you say, Jesus, are you here with me right now? The answer is the same. He has his arms open waiting for you to come to him. But he gave his life for you already. He's there. He's waiting. And so Jesus loves to unveil his presence. And then we finish up the passage in verse 32, in 33 to 35. So in verse 32, we read this. Then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Well, we, well, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They said, our hearts were, when Jesus was talking, we were walking, it was like something was burning inside of us. So as you walk with Jesus, notice that Jesus' presence and truth can bring a burning in our hearts. As you walk with Jesus through your day, as you read the scriptures, as you try to live for him, as you follow Jesus, there's times you're going to have a burning in your heart. Sometimes it's a burning that's just like this, like this warmth and this beauty. It's like, oh, he's with me, and he's leading me. He loves me. He's guiding me. Sometimes it's that kind of burning. Sometimes, for me, that burning in my heart is, is sort of like a, a holy warning. Kevin, that's not who you are. That's not how you talk. That's not how you think. That's not how you act. Sometimes it's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's a blessing of God's presence. But they say, when we were, before, we saw, before we saw him with our eyes, they basically said, didn't we feel something in our hearts? Didn't we know he was with us? So notice the presence of Jesus and feel the presence of Jesus. And then the passage continues in verse 33. And this is where we finish up. So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They, they had taken their seven-mile walk. Jesus reveals himself, disappears. They gotta go back and tell everybody. Again, no phone calls. No, the only way to tell everybody is what? Walk back seven miles. I bet they walked a lot faster going back because they were kind of downcast going this way, and then now, they're going, now they get back, right? They got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's, now the other, pe the crowd, the other people say to them as they walk in, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So Simon Peter had seen him. And then they say, then the two told what happened on their, on their way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So they walk in the room and the other people go, it's true, Peter saw Jesus. And they go, it's true, we saw Jesus. And we walked along, and we didn't know who it was. We had this conversation. We sat down. We had a meal. He broke the bread, and our eyes were open. And, Jesus, and then he just disappeared. What do we learn from that? That Jesus' resurrection presence and power and story, they move us to tell others that he is alive. When you encounter Jesus... When you meet him, when you know he's alive and he's in your life and he's giving you truth and he's guiding you, he's showing himself to you. You want other people to know. They headed back seven miles after just walking seven miles because they had to tell people they'd seen Jesus. When Jesus shows up in your life, you have a story to tell. When Jesus does something beautiful or powerful, you have a story to tell. I remember sitting with my dad after I became a Christian, I pr began praying for my dad for over 40 years, praying, probably almost daily, sometimes more than once a day, for my dad to know Jesus. He got fighting it and pushing back and pushing back. Well, at one point, I went to visit him, and I said, Dad, I, wanna, I just want to meet with you and talk about what Jesus has done in my life. I want to tell you how Jesus has shown up in my life, the things he's done. My dad said, okay. I took him out for lunch. We sat down. And I told for two hours, I told every single story I could think of for all my 40 years as a Christian of how God had shown up and shown himself. And my dad listened very intently. And I think, I think that my dad always kind of, you know, well, is this a religious thing? But I want to say, no, dad, it's a relationship thing. I've met Jesus. I know Jesus. But the one story that I shared with him that touched him the most was a strange story because it had to do with Sherry and I. And it had to do with generosity. And I said, Dad, I, so I was just trying to tell him every story. I wanted him to know that God is alive. Jesus works. He still speaks. He's still present. So I said, Dad, I, need to I want to tell you a story. I said, a couple years ago, some years back, um, we, or the church we were serving in Michigan, we, the church had grown so much that we didn't have any room for children. We, we ran out of room for children, for youth, so we had to build like a children's area, a youth area, actually a bigger worship center, and, had all these, and so we were going to do this big fundraiser for the church. Well, before I could ask the board to pray about giving toward it, I had to pray about what I was going to give. I'm the senior pastor, and I had to say, okay, God, I want to be the one to lead the way. And then I'll ask the board, and then I'll ask the congregation, we'll, you know, and then we'll trust that God will provide for us. So I began praying, and I, I prayed, and I, I sort of came up with the right amount to give and I came up with a number in my, in my heart and my mind that was the right amount. I thought it was the right amount to give. It was something that would stretch us a little bit, but we could afford it. That's what, so that's what we're going to give. But I knew I still had to talk to Sherry because we're in this together, right? And so then I met with the, our board. 
I remember in that meeting, I said, I want us to all get out of our chairs, around this table, get on our knees, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord to show us what each of us should do. So before we can go to the congregation, we have to pray about what we're going to give. We have to lead the way. So we got, and so I'm on my knees praying. I just hear God kind of whisper to me, double it. When you start doubling numbers, they get bigger really fast. So, and I come up with an amount that was appropriate that we could afford. And so then when, if, if I doubled the amount that I had in my heart, it was gonna be an amount that, we could, that we, would, we could do it, but it would like super stretch us, right? But I, I go, okay, Lord, but I still hadn't talked to Sherry yet. And so I'm telling this to my dad. I'm explaining this story. I said, and I, so I'm telling my dad that I'm hearing God give me numbers. For him, that's like a whole foreign concept, right? I'm praying and I'm asking God, what should we give? And God's giving me specific amounts in my heart. So then over the next week or so, I'm praying about it, and God just says to me again, Kevin, if you're gonna lead this church, you have to lead with faith, double it again. Now we're past comfortable and past uncomfortable to impossible. It would mean giving away all that we'd saved personally and all we'd saved for our boys for college and we still wouldn't have enough to give. That's how much it would be. I told this to my dad. I said, but dad, I knew I had to do it, but I had to go and talk to my wife and explain to her why we're gonna give away all of our savings and all of our savings for our kids' college and we're gonna trust God to provide the rest. So I go to Sherry. I said, honey, can we go out to lunch? I took her to, I wanted to give her some food, kind of soften her up. Um, (laughs) We went to Peking in our favorite little Chinese place, and I said to Sherry, hey, we need to pray together about what we're going to give toward this whole building project. And my wife, and I told my dad this. I said, so Sherry looked across the table at me, and she said, I already know. I said, well, how do you know? She said, well, I was running this last week, and I was on that one cul-de-sac by our house, and I was at the end of the cul-de-sac, and I knew you were going to come and talk to me, and we're going to pray about it. So I was just praying, and God gave me a number. And I said, what's the number? I said, looked at my dad, and I said, and I said to Sherry, what's the number? And she gave the number. I said, it's exactly what I came to. Of course, God had to speak to me three times to get me there. Um, but um, Sherry learns three times faster than I do when it comes to spiritual lessons, apparently. But, but I told this to my dad, and tears began to flow down his face because he realized we're not playing religion. I, I wasn't thrilled about giving the first amount that I came up with, much less the second and the third. But we watched over the next two years that God provided and we were able to give everything we committed. Then I actually told my dad, I said, Dad, about, about a year later, we had to do another building thing to, for growth in the church, and God told me, double it again. And I told him that Sherry and I, when we talked about that, and we came to that, we both felt God said, double it again. We'd already given the first amount. I said, we walked into our bedroom, we got on our knees, and we wept, and we thanked God next to our bed that he would lead us so clearly, and we knew he would provide. To my dad, that story made such an impact. A month before my dad died, he gave his heart to Jesus. I'm convinced that hearing story after story of people he loved and respected who had seen Jesus show up had impacted him. And you have stories to tell, little and big stories. So Jesus, this is our prayer. We want to walk with you. You have risen. You've conquered sin and death and hell. Jesus, for you to have conquered the Roman Empire would have been a small thing. You conquered all the power of sin and death and hell and our judgment, and you've given us forgiveness of sins in your name. We thank you for that. So we who walk with you, and people listening who don't walk with you, who someday might, Jesus, may we recognize that you are with us every moment of every day. And Jesus, I pray over these next five weeks, as we read all the accounts of people meeting you, Jesus, after you rose from the dead. May we learn what it looks like for us to walk with you every moment of every day, anywhere we go. Thank you, Jesus, that you're risen. Thank you that you don't leave us alone. Thank you that sometimes you veil our eyes and sometimes you reveal yourself, but you are always with us. Help us walk in your presence and power every moment of every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations of some some neat opportunities. One is this. If you want to grow in walking with Jesus and living for him, one of the best things you can do is discover how he's made you and gifted you and then develop those abilities for his glory. We do a class about once a quarter, once every uh, every, three to four months, about knowing your own gifting from God and how to use it. It's a one-hour class, and my wife Sherry is going to be leading that up in the Pacific Room the garden room, top of these stairs or around the stairs over there uh, in about five minutes. After I send you off, that class will be starting in in just a few minutes so you can join Sherry. If you're online, that class will be offered at one o'clock when Sherry's done teaching that class live here on campus. If you're outdoors, family worship venue, if you can stay, jump in for that class. If you're online or if you go home and you wanna get online, just register on the website and one o'clock today, Sherry will be teaching the class uh, live but online, all right? So that's available to you if you wanna jump into that. 
I met a wonderful couple this morning, a new military a couple here for the first Sunday. If you're here for your first Sunday with the military or if you've been here for a long time, but if you're a family of military or military, we have our quarterly military luncheon and that is in the Pacific, Pacific Room. I need to write these things down. Actually, it's written right here. I'm just not looking at it. In the Pacific Room. It's right there. Look at that. Right there in green, Pacific Room. Okay, so it's right there in the Pacific Room. Uh, and, and so if you're part of the military, this gives you a chance and, and it's not... Uh, it's just refreshments. They'll tell you about some of the ministries, kind of casual time to connect, but you can meet other people at Shoreline that are part of the military here and, and hopefully be able to connect with them and build some friendships. And so, and then also, if you need prayer, uh, if you're online and you need prayer, just call the number you see on the screen and uh, someone will pray for you or email your prayer needs. We'll put it on our prayer list. Get out to all our prayer people. They'll pray over the next week or two for whatever your needs you share with us. If you're on campus here, uh, whether you're outdoors, family worship venue, indoors, we have teams up at the front here. They're already getting here, ready to pray for you. One, two, at least three teams, maybe four. Uh, and so please, if you have a need, come and let people pray for you and lift you up before the Lord. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're new online, please just text the word welcome to the phone number that's gonna pop on your screen right now. Text the word welcome and we will reach out to you and connect with you and get to know you the best we can from wherever you are. If you're on campus, just go right here in the, in, in the lobby and there's a connection center. They have a little gift bag they wanna give you and give you a personal welcome. So make sure before you leave the campus, you pop by there and just say hi and just say, I'm new. And they wanna give you a warm welcome. If you're able to stand, will you stand with me? If you're at home, stand out in the courtyard, stand. And just open up your heart to receive this closing word of blessing. As we leave this time together, May you walk with the risen Jesus Christ. If you know him, notice him. Pay attention. Listen to his voice. Read his word. And know that he'll never leave you alone. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I invite you to open your heart to him because his arms are open. And he wants to walk with you all the days of your life. Go from this time walking with Jesus, shining his light everywhere you go, and we'll see you back here again next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week.